Hello and welcome to Non Sequitur News for July 12th, 2024. Today is a Time Machine episode. It's Season 3, Episode 194. I am Mayor Watt and that is the Sentient AI from the future. Good evening, sort of. Uh, hometown citizens, welcome to Non Sequitur News. And we're live. All right, we're streaming over on YouTube and Twitch. Actually, it's the other way around if you're looking at my monitors. Um, today we're going to be talking about these ads were sabotaged, the copied act, garden statues sold out at Costco. A different reason why Costco chicken was sold out. Anyway, nobody wants to visit Paris. Nearly all AT&T customers have been impacted by a hack. Uh, not sure. Not sure my stomach will be still. Taco Bell preps to win the fast food wars inside a beachfront property with secrets. A Bronze Age boat shopping list and humans to Mars, says NASA. That and more. Powered by hometown.com. Go check it out on the other side of this. All right, folks. All 10 of our articles are locked and loaded, so let's get into it. First article is over in the continuity report. Beastie Boy Sue Chili's owner over unauthorized use of sabotage in their ads. Okay, have you seen any Chili's commercials with sabotage? I don't even recall any Chili's ads anymore. Well, that's true, but I don't remember ever hearing any with sabotage, but I agree. I haven't heard any recently. Like, I. I've been, since this got submitted, I've been like, uh, has there ever been? What, what ad? But ads to me. Baby nowadays, back ribs. <laughs> <laughs> right? If really? Do they? Uh, oh, they've reduced. No, no, no. I don't know. That's all I can think of for Chili's ads. Yeah. They've, in re, they've reduced their menu options, apparently, to like just bare bones to, to minimize the complexity of like everybody talks about the number of SKUs being big. They want to reduce the number of SKUs, but then the number of SKUs is identical to the number of options. So there aren't very many options. And I don't even know if I, I haven't been to a Chili's in so long. Like I can't remember when, maybe sometime in the last year once or twice, but prior to the pandemic, I don't remember ever going to a Chili's since the pandemic. Like it hasn't even stood out. And I think we went um, once I put you on the on your uh, battery pack and I brought you to uh, the Chili's. And I don't even recall normally like I like the Chili's because of the chips and salsa. I don't even know if that that even it doesn't even stand out anymore, let alone an ad. What does this have to do with this article? Well, Beastie Boys has filed a lawsuit against the restaurant chain Brinker International Incorporated, owner of 30s Chili's restaurants in New York, for using their classic single Sabotage and referencing its video or its music video and advertisements without permission. The suit. Hey, that's interesting. It's not just the music, it's the music video. Yeah, and it's hyper local. So that's why I wouldn't like the Chili's oh, that are right. around. Okay around hometown they don't seem to advertise they they just have that kinetic energy i'm willing to bet that chili's was acquired um within the last five years and basically is riding the tide kind of it's the aol um process or the aol i don't know what you want to call it where they're so big that they don't have to advertise anymore because they've done so much in the past in advertising. Cause I do remember that baby back ribs thing, right? I want my chilies, right? Um, anyway, so the article is over at variety. Uh, Stephen J Horowitz put the article together. We have a really interesting article next after this one, by the way. Um, and so Beastie Boys filed a lawsuit against a restaurant chain Brinker International Incorporated, owner of Chili, 30 Chili's in, in uh, New York. So it's really local. 
They started doing the promotions around uh, November 2022, apparently. Now, see, here's the thing. Brinker probably relied on an external ad agency. So it may have, and it does seem like it's a dining focused company as appeared as compared to some of these other things we've seen with other restaurant groups. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, so you're talking about like the acquisition stuff, mm -hmm. the murder. Cause Brinker yeah. did that, I think in 2021, 2022, somewhere in there. What this advertising thing? No, the um, acquisition of these, oh, so I was right of some regional, but it's a dining company. It's not a capital. Oh, um, right, right, right. Yeah, it's not like the other ones we've An been talking about. Yeah, come, okay. Um, well, see, and that doesn't really mean much to me. It, they're slowly working. See, so having, and they might be. It's just how they're labeled in an article I was looking at. So. See, now here's a little. I don't know if everybody realizes this, but I was told a long time ago, um, and you may all. Y'all out there may have heard of this before, but there isn't really big margins in food service and uh, like other than like uh, alcohol makes some serious money, um, but it right, also the beverages, right? Yeah. Are where there's a lot of profit, but like food, it's really low margin. And so I, I had been told by several um, restaurant owners that you need to have multiple restaurants or you need to have a luxury restaurant where the prices are exorbitant and it's because it's got, you know, this mystique about it and you become a Michelin starred, whatever. Um, like that one restaurant puts on a show and it's $1,500 a seat plus alcohol right. on top of that, which is like 700 or $2,000 on top of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there isn't that much money, right? So when somebody does get to a certain point, they're like, okay, I'm putting way too much time and money and effort and all of this into it. And I'm big enough. Maybe somebody's going to look at me and want to, uh, aqua hire or not aqua hire, but merge or buy the company. And then they're out boom. And then all hell breaks loose. Quality starts getting crappy. And, um, the actual interior just kind of dangles there like a, a Toys R Us from the seventies. Wait, strike that. A Toys R Us from 2024 still looks like a Toys R Us from That's the 70s. That's right. <laughs> the same and thing. So whenever a company gets bought by what amounts to a company that just pushes uh, managers around, and by that I mean like, oh, this manager isn't working out. Let's put a different one in and take that one and put them over there or her or them or whatever it is. They just do this shuffle. Quality still goes to shit but they're still making money because they're cutting costs everywhere else. That's where I, I really hate mergers and acquisitions because it always hobbles the consumer. Like there, you get fewer options. Quality goes to crap. Service goes to crap. Um, I just don't like it. So I'm anti mergers and acquisition. So if you can't make your company work, then, and you can't sell it to the employees, and or you can't find somebody that's passionate enough about it to keep it at your level of quality, then you should just close your shit down because you're going to, but see, people want the money. So they're willing to just sell it to somebody who's gonna ride the wave of your hard work and reputation, which is why when I help out a business, I'm unheard of because I don't want I don't want to be involved with the reputational damage that somebody does later on. And then they point at me and say, well, this was the consultant or whatever, you know, I'm not involved. Um, I give advice and you do your work and you make it what it is. I just give you evidence. So when a company like this buys it, now you hear about Chili's reducing their menu options. You hear about stuff like this because they're trying to catch the wave, so to speak. In addition to claims about uh, that the sound recording for sabotage was used without authorization, the complaint alleges that the ads resemble the Spike Jones uh, directed music video for sabotage, which featured a bunch of the members. Um, and then they, then the variety kind of breaks off and talks about, um, the, the, um, the song and the album and whatever else. So the, the suit claims that the members of the group have and will continue to suffer damages in an unknown amount. And that Brinker acted with a willful disregard for the, to the, to harm the plaintiffs. 
this is a statutory damage. Um, that is the highest max that for each case of copyright violation, there's a $150,000 fine. So that could be pretty high depending on how they may have used the song or the video. And how they define what a what each case yeah. is. Like is it each a single time broadcast? an ad errors, for example. See, but that's not how it has been interpreted in the past. Interpreted in the past is the estimated number of violations. So if somebody downloaded that video a thousand times, it's a thousand times 150,000. Right. I mean, I could add up very fast. If I broadcast it here in the stream, it's however many people are in the stream. If anybody can calculate it at the time or basically a warrant would require Twitch and YouTube to go here. This is how many people. Yeah, it's a it's pretty trippy copyright violation. It is so overwhelming. It's like juggernaut smashing through a wall. It, it isn't a scalpel, you know, you want. Uh, like society needs a scalpel, n not, you know, high explosives. And that's really what DMCA is. That's what copyright is. Um, yeah. Anyway, interesting. But sabotage was made back in when was it? They said. Um, 94. Maybe the nineties. 94. Yeah. So 30 years later, it's still. I mean, you still hear it sometimes, I think, on the, like, I think it's still popular. I mean, not obviously as much as it might have been, but. 30 years later, if I was still feeding off of something that I did 30 years ago. It'd yeah, be I, know, I guess I'd be a musician, right? I'd be an artist. <laughs> Okay, let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in Non Sequitur News. The AI Focus Copied Act would make removing digital watermarks illegal. I agree. I absolutely agree. Just hearing that that title, I'm like, yep, makes sense to me. Why wouldn't if you have if if you don't have any other intent than to promote somebody's work? by talking about it, by amping it up, you wouldn't remove the watermark. Why would you remove the watermark? It's well, not because yours. this is probably the scraping of information. I don't even think it's the representation. And it's like the, the collecting to begin with, I suspect. I, I, I do suspect love the name of this statute. Yeah, the copy act. So it's the content origin protection and integrity from edited and deep faked media act. <laughs> they worked so I mean, they hard. did like you always say, yeah. <laughs> But it does. It really works there. Could it, like you can it tell actually, what it's about. It's not just some catchy name or something. Yeah, and it isn't actually even copied. It's copied. Mm, yeah, copied I know. Ma. <laughs> exactly. It's been copied, Ma. They um, just it, trailed off at the end. <laughs> yeah, uh, they got really tired. It's so long that by the time you finish saying deep fake, you're out of air. Uh, mm -hmm. Never mind. So it would uh, direct the National Institute of Standards and Technology to create standards and guidelines that help prove the origin of content and detect synthetic content like through watermarking. Um, and uh, yeah, you can watermark, but uh, yeah, 30, 30 years ago, I created watermarking technology for audio and um, video, and it was easily expunged um, with a sophisticated set of tools easily so you don't have to and as time has gone on those tools have become even easier to uh, accomplish um, and with ai you can remove the the uh, watermarking so it says to create the standards and guidelines i'm not sure what that it would actually attest to but i think what really needs to happen is um, we really do need to come up with a set of tools that identify what the original is and you would think that it would be the copyright office, right? You send a digital version of your work to the copyright office and the, and the first across the line is the one that receives the, the credit for it. You'd think, but that's not how it's set up. But that's not how it's set up. So yeah, NIST is um, gonna be tasked with that kind of an assignment though. And it's kind of like a, a, a patent. So for instance, I applied for a patent and uh, somebody had uh, suppressed the publishing of theirs because it was a um, business process and trade secret. 
And so when I applied for mine, mine was dismissed because it was six months after the person submitted theirs. And so, um, but she had no way to know that because the other one wasn't publicly available. Correct. Yeah. And so mine actually, um, is, <laughs> it's really interesting. And if I were to look back, I would probably be able to argue a bit more definitively, but, um, yeah, this was, it was interesting times in the legal field. So anyway, um, this uh, is being talked about by variety or sorry, not variety, uh, the verge.com and Lauren Finer is the author. The text statement says the copied act seeks to protect journalists and artists from having their work used by AI models without their consent. This comes on the heels of an article that I talked about yesterday, um, where in um, past journalists from a website that hasn't even been in operation anymore for like five years or something like that had been scraped. The domain had been acquired and then brought back up online with the old um, journalists and on top of it, new content that was AI generated, basically tarnishing their names. And they went livid about it. I agree. Was this the one about T-U-A-W or something? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, um, what do they call it? I don't, it's I don't the know. Apple, uh, the unauthorized Apple website. Um, and so they all basically started talking about it publicly on social media about how this website isn't them. Um, and again, I agree. The moment that you use somebody's name or their work, if you claim that it's like their work, fine. If you say that it is their work, it's fraud. If you use their name without saying like, Hey, I got inspiration from this person. If you say that it is their work or the writing is their work, it is fraud and it should be charged. It's a civil action um, until the overt nature is harming the reputation of the person and then it can rise to a criminal action. But it's a, it's really about respect for the other people that are involved in this. I would never take somebody else's work and say that it is mine. I mean, it is absolutely ridiculous for somebody to do that. And so this copied act is going to do one thing when in reality, I know that it's so naive, but the idea of society shifting away from being little pieces of poo, you know, it, that's what really <laughs> right. needs to happen. So content owners, including broadcasters, artists, newspapers could sue companies that they believe use their materials without permission or tampered with authentication marks. Um, now the whole thing about without their permission is problematic because you really can talk about other people's stuff. You should be able to show people other people's stuff and talk about it. But this becomes a spinoff of copyright battering Ram instead of scalpel. So, yeah. And this, that part's going to be really hard to manage. I think. Yeah. It's going to be really easy to claim it, but who's going to know? Yeah, exactly. So, which is, um, anyway, the, the, uh, state attorneys general and, uh, the FTC could also enforce the bill, which is, which is backers say prohibit anyone from removing, disabling, or tampering with content provenance information. Again, fine. If you want, if that is what's required, then fine. But you really shouldn't be able to beat somebody about the head and shoulders because they're showing the work and talking about it, adding value. And it shouldn't be up to you to decide what is value. Uh, what if I'm critiquing your work? What if I'm talking about the material content of it? Because you happen to do something like write this. Um, right. And, and because you have a venue, it, it shouldn't, um, prevent other people from looking at your work and discussing with other people. Um, and if it can't survive the criticism, then really this is public participation in discussion about public policy in general. 
But don't you get the impression this is a more wide scale things like pick a large tech company? Yes. Like, I don't think this is really about individual people. I mean, sure, they could be subject to it, but I feel like it's more like the widespread pulling of all data from somewhere. Yeah, it's screen scraping and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's keep going. This one is over in non sequitur news. Costco unexpectedly sold out of chickens this week, but it's not the chickens that it usually sells out of. It's the 22 inch garden statue roosters. That is according to this article from Business Insider. I'll be quick. You know, I didn't know there was a run on those. <laughs> yeah, it's really the weird. They're only 22 inches. So um, it's often said that you can buy anything at Costco and that includes a 22 inch chicken statue, a comically proportioned steel garden chicken has apparently struck a chord with Costco shoppers. The $38 product unexpectedly sold out online, leaving Costco fans feeling left out. This is one of these meme things. I'm sure it is. It also makes me think of it could be in that Target SNL skit. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like you're checking out with your eggs or whatever, okay. but then you come through with this and the clerk gets really wound up. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you want to buy a uh, wait? Uh, Hey, you're buying one of these 22 inch garden statue roosters. What aisle are, are they in? And they point and then she's like, I'm out. <laughs> so I think I can tell why it it's kind of cartoonish. Yeah, um, it's kind of like a, it's like a character, right? It's yeah, cute. yeah, for sure. It's for those listening to the podcast. It's basically a, it's a 22 inch steel um, rooster with an orange or a yellow head, a, a rusted orange tail, a blue body, um, and yellow legs and, and a green, what are they waddle? No, the waddle is the thing that's underneath, right? The, right. I don't, I don't know, but it has a waddle and then it's head feathers are no, green. I couldn't even see that with the background. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, oh, did I say the name of this? Dominic Reuter over at businessinsider.com put the article together. There's no deck statement, but basically they say a comically proportioned steel garden chicken has apparently struck a chord with Costco shoppers. It's 38 bucks. It's sold out. It is the mean uh, item of uh, what July. So it used to be right. I hope uh, it gets to travel like the garden gnomes have traveled sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I told that story about how somebody stole a, it was a rooster in a, in a tuxedo. It was a rooster? Yeah, it was a rooster in a tuxedo. Oh, interesting. Um, if I remember right, um, I don't think it was a penguin. I think it was a rooster. I know that it was in a tuxedo, but anyway, it had been stolen from a house that it had been actually mounted above their garage. And, um, they stole it off the platform and it traveled various places and sent pictures back apparently. And then it was returned <laughs> uh, years later. So, okay, let's keep going. That's too silly. So this next article uh, is over in the mobile channel. Delta says Olympics will cost it $100 million because no one wants to visit Paris. Now another airline, it might be because people don't want to fly. Uh, well, another right. airline. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense based on the headline only. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't know. I think this is there. It's <laughs> Delta's taking some serious copium to deal with why people aren't flying. It's because they don't want to. They don't want to fly. I don't think. So another airline is losing money because of the Olympics. Delta Airlines says that they've reduced travel to Paris because of the games will cost the carrier about a hundred million dollars compared to what it might otherwise be expecting with its record size second quarter revenues. Um, Melvin Backman over at Quartz or QZ.com. The deck statement says business travelers are more important than tourists to an airline's bottom line. I don't know. Keep the damn tires on the plane in the engines from catching fire oh i see so because of all the hoopla with the olympics the business travelers don't want to go to paris so now they're losing money on those routes correct yep the olympics are not a good are, are not good for airline revenues he said and this year i think it's no exception to that so while we see very favorable backdrop for europe in its totality there are some challenges for paris as uh, generally business travel uh, ceases to and from local markets as the Olympics approach. Yeah, because they don't want to deal with all the crap. 
um, um, earlier this month, Air France, which has a royalty partnership with Delta, said, also said that the Olympics were a drag on revenues. In their case, a hit that was $193 million. Don't you feel like they're lining their case up so that they can go ask for more money? Yeah, really? Yep. And uh, what is it this time? What really? I mean, why don't you charge? Another right? country dared to have an Olympics? I mean, like, I don't know what they <laughs> Charge properly for your say. flight so that every passenger is a little bit of money and, and not, you know what I'm saying? Uh, right why do you have I to have know. these Maybe irrational make profits? more than two inches of space around people's yeah. spots and the thing that might help yeah it's asinine all right let's keep going the next art article is over in the mobile channel cyber criminal stole text and call records from nearly all of at&t's customers in a cybersecurity debacle so bad it could only belong to one telecom provider at&t <laughs> has announced that pretty much all of its customer data was just hijacked. Lucas I Robeck. imagine they have a lot of customers. Yeah, and a lot of texts and a lot of... I'm sure that there are some very nervous people out there. So the article's over at gizmodo.com. Uh, the next statement says, in a cybersecurity buckle so bad, only one, uh, it could only belong to a telecom provider, AT&T, has announced that pretty much all of its customer data was just hijacked. Again, Lucas Ropek over at Gizmodo put the article together. It was a, a filing at the Security and Exchange Commission um, because when it reaches a certain level and you are a certain size company, you are required to file with the SEC to see if anything will have a anything that has a fiduciary impact on the performance of stocks. Um, or the business in general, you have to notify. Oh, I see. Is that so they could, if needed, like stop trading or something? And perform other certain actions, yeah. Um, notify people of the compromise, et cetera. Um, and to notify of any activities that might instill integrity into the system so that it doesn't cause a collapse. So we launched an investigation and engaged leading cybersecurity experts to understand the nature and scope of the criminal activity. We took steps to close off the illegal access point. Um, that's all their statement that's in the filing. It's almost boilerplate. The hacker exfiltrated files containing AT&T records between April 14th and April 25th. So they were in there for... 11 days um, occurred approximately between actually May 1st and October 31st, as well as on January 2nd, 2023. So they'd been in the system over various periods of time, but they know that the hacker ultimately exfiltrated files. So it says, thank, thank, thankfully, the records that were stolen did not have uh, identifying data points according to uh, the company personal information such as social security numbers dates of birth other personally identifiable information were not stolen nor were the contents of texts and calls so i don't understand what was actually taken so, then yeah what did they get if none of that was there records of customer call and text interactions oh does that mean for example the number such and such called number such and such i mean or yeah, I don't right. understand what they've actually gleaned. So instead, the information that was taken reveals phone numbers that a particular user called or was called by during the given period, as well as the frequency with which the interactions occurred. The records identify the numbers with which an AT&T or MVNO, and that's a secondary seller of the, the same network as AT&T, um, anyway, wireless number interacted during these periods, including AT or telephone numbers of AT&T wireline customers. So all it was, was the phone numbers. So this isn't as grandiose. But as I mean, was. isn't that kind of as, unless you're somebody who's like a public figure, that could be a different issue, but like, isn't that kind of the same as like a spammer? Yes and concept has access to gazillions of it right either yes. by accident or intentionally 
Yes, as long as they don't have the contents of the text um, or like SMS or whatever it might be, then all it is is phone numbers and the frequency by which somebody called. So they're going to know, like, for instance, that Mayor Watt calls somebody every day, that kind of a thing. Like, OK, well, big deal. The, the problem becomes when somebody's a target. And so yeah, agreed. they find that person's phone numbers and then they start calling all of the people that they call to find out what the connections are. And, you know, then they find out that Mayor Watt is actually the mayor of a different town as well as hometown. And uh -oh. yeah, and then I started getting blackmailed. Ugh, not again. <laughs> anyway. I can only start out, start up so many towns, virtual towns on the internet. So that it says the timing of the hacking is weird, given that in April, AT&T also disclosed a large separate data breach with which impacted 73 million customers. Most of those customers were former customers, but some they say, in fact, were 7.6 million um, were current. Yeah. Uh, it seems like they are kind of like a sieve, so. Well, and is all this coming from the same activity? And if so, how much more has been taken and nobody has even figured it out yet? Yep. Yep. And once they're in the system, hopefully they don't have, they haven't set up anything else that allows them for long-term access. Okay, let's keep going. The next article is over in the Warcrafters channel because researchers create Dune-like pee pants for the next generation of astronauts or uh, streamer, um, competitive Why? gamer, <laughs> and maybe even wealthy, overly dedicated gamers. Oh, they! I don't. I didn't even read the rest of that until I made my comment. Anyway, one of the coolest things about the tech world is when science fiction becomes science reality. And really, just given a little bit of time, science fiction becomes science fact. So, uh, research team in the U.S. U.S. Come on, has developed a system in the form of snug-fitting pairs of pants to collect urine and extract potable water or potable water um, from it. So the Dune-like technology is aimed at replacing the diapers worn by astronauts during spacewalks and perhaps even PC gamers too dedicated to their monitors for killstreak breaking toilet trips. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Just why? Uh, why not? I titled this one. Um, not sure my stomach will be still. Hey, bipolar cat. How are you? Welcome to the show. Good to see you. Um, I don't think I've ever asked you if it's okay to say on the stream, on the show, what you write in um, in the chat. So if you say it's okay, then I'll repeat it. If you have questions or comments or anything like that. I always ask before I say it on the stream, since I don't um, display it anywhere anymore. So Nick Evanson over at PCGamer.com put this article together so that we didn't have to go through life wondering when, when will they create still suits so that I can just I mean, game is that constantly. Really what you wanted from Dune out of all the things. Oh, I have asked. Oh, I'm sorry. I normally don't forget. Well, thanks. Um, look, I mean, why didn't they make the ornithopter or something? Probably, I don't think the ornithopter can actually exist. Not in its current. That's completely irrelevant. <laughs> um, yeah, the design. Oh, wait, hold on a second. The design looks far more appealing than the adult, adult diaper spacewalkers currently have to use. This is not the entire adult diaper, by the way. <laughs> that, that, that would be a space suit. But anyway. So uh, one of the coolest things about the tech world, huh? I don't know if this is really going to rise to the whole, this is cool tech, man. But I suppose if you're, if you are, if this is a legit still suit and you can wear it out somewhere so that you don't die because you don't have enough water, right? Because we're usually uh, sweat, it's wicking away. Our clothes pull it away from our skin and then it's gone. It evaporates over time or it just evaporates off of our skin and we don't even realize it because it's so subtle until we work out. I, I think it's brilliant in the way that it, like a survivability kind of a thing 
but is society ready for it? This is one of the things that we talk about, you know, science, technology, and society. Those are the three things. Um, so a team of researchers at Weill, uh, Cornell Medicine and Cornell University in the U.S. have developed a system that looks infinitely better than the diapers and also immediately sets off dune vibes. Rather than a bulky absorbent material that stores urine and feces around your nethers, the new design comprises a pair of snug fitting pants fitted with a vacuum catheter for urine co co uh, collection. I can't believe I'm saying this all out loud. I'm not prepared no, for this. I don't know that that's going to be an easy sell to people. But you know how it is. Like if somebody who has a huge platform like does this and I don't know, maybe it takes off. I don't know. <laughs> Please don't take it off. Just leave it. <laughs> leave it on and then you can take it off at home. The research team argues that the improved performance and sufficient water in case of contingency scenario is worthy trade for the increase in mass and battery requirement. There's also a potential for technology to be used outside of the space industry too. And there are plenty of medical applications uh, for something that's far more hygienic and less bulky than an adult diaper. And so they say at the very end, they say, if I'm permitted to be somewhat silly or nausea inducing, um, I can imagine there will be a few dedicated gamers interested in this as I generally know a few people who wear garments to ensure that they can play games nonstop for hours on end without any toilet breaks. Wow. Oh, I don't know. What I don't neck. understand in the survival context is that would be really good, but who is going to plan ahead, at least in the current age? Preppers. And go, oh, I need this, right? Preppers. If you're going to go do something long distance, particularly nowadays with the way the climate is, if you're going to try and go across the desert in something other than, you know, um, very reliable powered vehicle transport right um you're gonna ride a bike you're going to run you're going to try and hike across something like death valley you know i mean some knuckleheads do that and it's ill prepared but if they have something like this waiting in the wings where they can just don it at the last moment and survive you know another day um it makes the difference so now wait how much did this thing weigh it had a battery pack. Oh, 20 pounds. Okay, well, that's not too bad. 20 pounds to save your butt if you're doing something. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound like much of a trade-off. Yeah. As long as it works, right? But it is a, a battery-powered gadget, so how long does the battery work? That kind of a thing. Right, right, and will you be able to recharge it depending on where you are? Well, you'll need it for our next article because it's over in the Hatch Ideas channel. Taco Bell unveils a luxury early retirement community, and here's how to claim your spot. We have this running joke about Taco Bell winning the fast food wars uh, because uh, Demolition Man is a documentary. And just a few Only years... Only eight from, years away. Yeah, it's not, not too far away. Taco Bell Rewards members will have the opportunity to secure a spot at the cantinas starting July 16th. So three days away, folks. So be sure to, I hope you have enough Taco Bell Rewards card uh, points. So the article is by Carl Stofers over at entrepreneur.com and etiquette, edited by Jessica Thomas. But the deck statement again says, Taco Bell Rewards members will have the opportunity to secure a spot at the cantinas uh, or cantinas uh, starting July 16th. That's their new product line, by the way, cantina. Oh, I didn't realize that. Do you think they will have um, anything like a Chihuahua rescue at the community so you can see Chihuahuas like in their commercials? <laughs> it's one of the bonuses. You can that have a support to me, animal. That would be a necessity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody has a Chihuahua, or as I call them, Chihuahuas. Uh, the community promises a next level culinary experience, I bet, and uh, includes senior inspired recreations such as pickleball. So, pickleball is a senior inspired recreation. Oh, it actually has like a huge following among um, 
senior so citizens. Really? Because I know a lot of people that play pickleball, and I wouldn't. <laughs> I would not like well. to utter the phrase, "Oh, you're one of the olds." Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get a, a pickleball bounced off your head. So yeah, build is catering to Gen Z's culture that values a slower, more relaxed pace of uh, life. Taco Bell is launching the Cantinas, a Taco Bell themed early retirement community in San Diego, accessible only to its rewards members. Where in San Diego? Hey, well, how early retirement is this? Gen Z is not at retirement yet. But they got money for early retirement. Maybe that's what it is. Early retirement oh, okay. community. Got it. Um, wow. Okay. So promising a next. Uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. The weekend membership is priced at $150 and includes shared overnight accommodations for the ticket holder and a guest. This member offers complete access to the amenities, recreation, dining, uh, entertainment, and more with afternoon naps encouraged. So, wait a minute. This is more like a Four Seasons than it is. Right. It sounds like it. Like a retirement Unless community. you can, like, live permanently there. I don't know. Right. Alternatively, the day pass is $50 per day and grants the ticket holder and a guest full access. So, it's only, it's not that much. It's um, actually less expensive than a lot of other travel accommodations. <laughs> They're calling it a talk oasis. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Oh they my gosh, it. this actually crosses. Remember we were talking about how Comic-Con had such exorbitant um, hotel prices accommodation over, yeah, yeah. prices. So maybe, oh, this is going to be after Comic-Con, I think. Never mind. It'll, but it'll still be there for the next comic-con if maybe it survives who knows it says this isn't the first time the chain the top franchise and an entrepreneur's 2024 franchise 500 ranking has created a fully immersive experience for fans in 2019 taco bell took over a hotel in exclusive palm springs and turned it into the bell a taco bell hotel and resort it had a taco oasis the weekend experience featured everything from Taco Bell embroidered waffle robes to Taco Bell or taco shaped sugar cookies left on the hotel pillows to an exclusive sampling of Taco Bell's then unreleased toasted cheddar chalupa. Okay, well, now I'm going to have to look this up. <laughs> that can the uh, Taco Bell, the cantinas dun dun. All right. The next article is over in Hatch Ideas as well. Inside a $60 million beachfront mansion with subterranean secrets and Italian flair. The owner of Mar Piatra a Beachfront Mansion in Delray Beach, Florida, is looking to shatter a local price record with an act asking price of $60 million. Just in time for all? hurricane season. Would you buy? I wouldn't buy a mansion in florida no so for some Ray, reason i was thinking this was new york because there was another article in hometown about a high-priced mansion in new york today oh really i thought this would have been in uh, san diego as well so um the upper levels are adorned with 300 stone carved columns vaulted ceilings even a fresco painted in florence italy and then brought over here i suppose now, the owner of the beachfront property in Delray Beach, Florida, is looking to shatter that price record we mentioned already. Meanwhile, the sub, the home subterranean space is packed with modern luxuries, including a supercar gallery. And this should probably be supercar. Um, supercar gallery, glowing tequila bar, and a steel vault packed with piles of cash. Wow. Yeah. And that yeah. looks pretty nice. I, is it actually on the ocean? It says it's beachfront. Yeah. I think it has a long, this is like a, you know, like a shotgun. Oh, um, yeah. Like, a, I forgot what it's called, but yes. Yeah. So basically it's a, a narrow lot, but really long, has its own beach. And then there's actually two buildings, an entrance building, which is probably where they're parking the cars. 
and then the mansion itself. And then because this is CNBC, I don't know how many pictures they're going to have. If this was Business Insider, there would be pictures galore to really hype this up. But um, the 23,000 uh, plus square foot home is called Mar, Mar Piatra. How does this have a how does this have a basement in Florida? I mean, that thing has to be hermetically sealed. Otherwise, there's going to be water infiltrating in this thing. Yeah, it seems like an odd place to have a basement. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this thing is five feet below sea level already. Cass says, ah, my summer cabin. Yeah. You know, I shook my couch out earlier today and it was 60 million in there. So I guess I'll just go and buy this. Um, <laughs> uh, the two distinct design themes were wrapped in a limestone clad residence located on the town's ultra high end South Ocean Boulevard. The 23,000 plus square foot home is called Mar Piatra Italian for sea stone. They say so much went into this. Oh, it's a video. Um, took five years to complete, employed dozens of craftsmen, paint, painters and sculptors many of them from Italy. Tons of limestone were shipped here from Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Hand-carved marble made the journey from Verona, Italy, and massive panels of cedar arrived from Colombia. Gotta have your pool right next to your ocean. <laughs> right, I mean, couldn't just have one. So it has 100 feet of beachfront. There's a main residence and a guest house, and all together nine bedrooms, 12 full baths, seven half baths. The climate controlled subterranean garage. Oh, it is. It, the garage is actually underground, adds 4,000 more feet, and with even more space added via a covered area such as a luxurious loggia that houses the, another kitchen, bar, lounge, dining area. All right. Oh my gosh. The vaulted scene. Uh, the, they're not vaulted. What is that called? Um, oh, like a tray ceiling? <laughs> No, that's sure not that's it called. either. Because it's not really vaulted. It it has the like compartments set deep inside what would be vaulted, but it's actually it looks like it's about fifteen feet up, and then it has this really elaborate um, ceiling. I can't remember what that's called off the top of my head, but that's okay. So like a um, tin ceiling. Tin? No, that's not tin. That's okay though. Um, so public records show that he bought the lot along with a lot across the street on the intracoastal waterway for 9 million back in 20, 2002. At the time, the oceanfront parcel had a hotel on it, which means that the land was under hotel zoning regulations. Uh, Musa, who immigrated to the U.S. from Italy, tore down the old building so he could build a beachfront family home that paid homage to his home country. Look at that. This whole thing is wide open right here underneath oh yeah the whole thing it's is all basically open to the pillars. elements yeah pretty wild wow uh we need to put this in the wanted show later today yeah <laughs> <I think> so. <laughs> um anyway in all honesty though it's just too frou-frou for me it's just too complex it's too busy it's just overwhelming um not to my senses, but just to my pragmatism. I, I like <laughs> wide open spaces and. I mean, the exterior and everything is like, okay, this is neat. It's on the ocean and it's nice that they have the open air areas, but the inside seems to be very ostentatious. There you go. That's the right term for it. Yeah. And when it is dialed back, it's still, <laughs> still ostentatious. So some people would call it luxury. I think we'd call it ostentatious. So the ultra luxury real estate market will continue to prosper. Wealthy clients love Palm Beach County, valuing oceanfront locations, privacy and uniqueness above all else. Actually, it's a tax haven and you can't have your property taken away from you in uh, bankruptcy. So um, to support that claim, Adzim points just to 400 meters down the street to a sale in Highland Beach, where just this May an oceanfront traded, uh, uh, sorry, a home traded for $50 million or more than $2,800 per square foot. 
on this coastline Mar Piatra could actually be considered a relative bargain. It's only, oh wait, a nearby smaller home also on South Ocean Boulevard recently listed for $74 million or $5,100 a square foot. Wow, these are pretty uh, high prices for real estate. I guess yeah. it's all about the location. I like the doors and the windows. I mean, they're rounded, they're arched instead of a typical square. And the typical square is yeah. is due to budget. So you can plus this room doesn't look as ostentatious as some of the others. No, it almost looks rendered to me, but it's okay. I'm sure it's legit. This would be distracting this vertical wall. So they've got this um, kind of a an accent piece behind a very a seriously thin flat screen TV. Um, but it's these like one by one strips um, that almost go to the ceiling, but it's it's they're really narrowly placed. It almost creates a moray effect on the in the picture. But hey, look at that view. I mean, that's the thing that's really neat about this house. Yeah. Yeah. Still and it has like an outdoor living room, basically. So if anybody wants to donate $60 million, you know, I'll send you my PayPal. PayPal would probably explode if suddenly there was a $60 million transfer into it. Wouldn't that be hilarious? So much money would be it lost would. to the transfer fee, though. Did you see there was a recent article about, I want to say Serena Williams. It doesn't really matter who it was, but they tried to deposit yeah. like a hundred thousand dollar check in bank drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah. didn't go over well. <laughs> Apparently not. Yeah. So inside the limestone structure is a two story guest house spanning more than 2,700 square feet with three bedrooms, three full baths, two half baths. Okay. So let's <laughs> think about this. The guest house is larger than a lot of people's houses. Yeah. Yeah, this is the the this guest house is like your typical house. Um, that's like the standard size or something like that, if I recall correctly. In the U.S., in, yeah. In the US, I think yeah. it's pretty large for other locations, but yeah. So what I thought was a garage is actually a guest house that <laughs> that stands as the barrier to entry. Wow. All right. Let's keep going. We got two more articles and then uh, we're going to take a break. And right after this, well, not right after this show, um, at around five o'clock, um, we may, we're going to do the non sequitur news. Um, that's supposed to be for July 13th, which is today. Um, and then I'm evaluating the rest of the shows for today. Um, we typically do four shows a day. Um, I'm doing a time machine, this show, um, along with the sentient AI because we didn't do it yesterday. Anyway, um, this next article is over in non sequitur news, bronze age boat sales as replica made using 4,000 year old shopping list among the evidence used to construct the boat, uh, was an ancient clay tablet dating back to the 21st century BC. That's insane. So it says evidence among the evidence used to construct the boat evidence. Why would they call it evidence? Yeah, that's an odd phrase there yeah so this article is over at newsweek.com aristos giorgio is the author the replica vessel departed from the coast of abu dhabi the capital of the united arab emirates covering a distance of 50 nautical miles in the persian gulf with a crew of 20 people on board it passed a number of rigorous tests over two days reaching speeds up to 5.6 knots that's pretty cool Yeah, the goal of the Experimental Archaeology Initiative launched in 2021 is to shed light on how people in the region lived more than 4,000 years ago while also preserving the UAE's maritime heritage. The reconstructed Megan or M-A-G-A-N boat, uh, it might be Magan, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, was designed and constructed by a multidisciplinary team of experts, including archaeologists and engineers, as part of the project led by Abu Dhabi's planned Zayed National Museum in collaboration with Zayed University and New York University Abu Dhabi. Does it look similar to a, say a Viking um, era boat? Certainly looks like it, huh? It has the same 
Like the um, things on the end to me turn. look like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it shows what people were capable of doing, at least at this size. 20 people on it seems like much, but I don't know if that's normal for the time. You know, if it's being reconstructed and populated with the same number of people that would normally be on it. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say maybe, I mean, the last time that I was on a boat, it was about this size and there were maybe eight people on it total. Um, but none of us were functionaries either. We were actually, other than ballast. <laughs> I don't know what the full, because I believe yeah, that. Yeah, that seems like that could be pretty crowded pretty quickly. Yep. So the vessel's design was based on ancient models with a naval engineer determining an appropriate length, width, and depth for the boat to ensure it would float while carrying cargo and crew. Um, so basically, maybe on the size, the size of this thing was much larger um, than it needed to be so that they could sit there and say it can carry this amount in those times because modern materials allows us to be bigger with fewer get more done with more with fewer right people. that's true so we designed the ship using a combination of textual iconographic archaeological evidence from the region this includes an ancient clay tablet from Iraq listing a large quantity of materials likely used as a shopping list for an active shipping or shipyard um, building. The ship of the or sorry, the shape of the vessel is based on ancient clay models found in Iraq. That's interesting. We still do that. Yeah, that is clay model design stuff um, today. Like a prototype is actually built out of wood with a clay. Um, uh, is that to avoid um, like wasting materials um, it's well like in prototyping it so that you can see it at scale and you can actually like recover some of that clay if it doesn't work out you have time and so you it is for limiting waste um, but then they sometimes that clay model actually persists it it hardens into basically a permanent structure um but you get to see it in full scale to the dimensions that are going to be specified for the final product um but you just sit there and and shave away the stuff that you don't want and if you go a little too deep then you can put more on um it's it's really cool that way you know exactly in the real world and you don't get some dimension glitch um, when you're 3D modeling it, only 3D modeling it. And then you print it out or whatever it is you're gonna do and there's something screwy. It's kind of like what NASA is doing with AR now, um, projecting instructions and projecting 3D models into the wearer's um, field of view so that they can see exactly where things go. Physical objects don't act the same way, don't have the same issues. And so you know exactly what you're getting if you take your measurements from a physical model. It doesn't always work out digitally. So the reed bundles that they used were attached to an internal structure of wooden frames and coated with bit uh, bitumen, which is basically a very viscous liquid there's it's like pitch um a viscous liquid derived from crude oil a waterproofing technique is used in the region in ancient times it's actually used not just in ancient times but there's evidence of bitumen uh bitumen bitumen um impregnated rope that's used in like pirate ships and stuff like that um up to even today when when somebody is making uh, an older ship reproduction or something like that they actually use that bitumen infused ropes and and they basically wedge it into the cracks between boards so that it stops water from infiltrating um, and then they do the same thing with the boards themselves 
I mean, I guess that's like an early version of waterproofing. It is. Yep, yep. So the latest reconstruction is the largest of its kind ever attempted, according to the project and ancient texts. These types of vessels were known as Megan boats, uh, which is also the name of the ancient region that now encompasses the UAE and part of Oman. Megan boats uh, were renowned for their design and maritime capabilities, enabling trades with locations as far as uh, far away as the Mesopotamians, an ancient region centered on today's uh, modern day Iraq and South Asia. So uh, ocean going Pretty cool. All right. So let's jump into our last article. And this is over in non sequitur news as well. NASA is investing in a, a rocket that could get us to human, get us humans to Mars and back in two months. That's what they're saying. Traveling wow, at 100,000 I mean, miles that's per a hour. lot sooner than expected. Or do you mean the duration of the voyage? The duration. Um, yeah. What do you, wait, what? Uh, I thought we were going to go in two months from now. Oh. <laughs> I remember we were just talking about how far off that was. That was. Uh, sign me up. No, no, no. Um, so once fully <laughs> developed, the pulsed plasma rocket could blast through space at 100,000 miles per hour. So to Mars and back in two months. So let's see here. When can I leave? I'll be back in two months. Who, as long as Boeing is not doing it, it's fine. So NASA aims to send astronauts to Mars by the 2030s. Um, but the current technology, a journey that will be years long. See, and that's the problem. There's We've talked about it before. Um, essentially, every five years, the previous technology is so outgunned by the newest technology that it would pass the five-year-old technology in space. <laughs> right, and then they'd be like, oh, there was oh. five years down the drain. Yeah, there, wait, I'll see you in, and if if it normally would take 10 years to get there, they would be there for five years waiting for this older group of people, which <laughs> right. if it takes 10 it's, years it's to get there. such a weird concept. Yeah, pretty wild. So, yeah. NASA has invested $725,000 in a new rocket system that could solve one of the major obstacles standing in our way to send humans to Mars travel time. That's all that they are investing. Is there not some like three zeros missing from this $725,000 in our new rocket system? Yeah, that seems very low. Like that might buy like the, the cap to one of the seals or something yeah or one of the little o-rings um right, so right the article is over at businessinsider.com by ellen lapoint that might be misleading like it might be one of those where there's like a partnership and there's other investment partners or something yeah it's interesting let's see they'd be exposed to high levels of solar and cosmic radiation the harmful effects of zero gravity and long period of isolation this is all stuff that we talked about yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, space radiation is arguably the biggest threat. Astronauts who spend just six months in space are exposed to roughly the same amount of uh, radiation as a thousand chest x-rays. And that puts them at a risk for cancer, nervous system damage, bone loss, heart disease. Yeah, it's not a pleasant... I mean, it's mostly harmless while you're out there. You don't really feel the effects, but then when you come back and you're measured... You have bone loss, you have muscle wasting, um, you might suffer from heart disease, you might um, be at risk for cancer, etc. And the isolation, I think, is going to be one of the more surreal things. So getting them, getting astronauts to the destination and or back in only a month, I think that's doable. The technology holds the potential to revolutionize space exploration. So... At 100,000 miles per hour, it would, it seems like it would invoke its own, like, G-forces, even in space. You're not just going to be floating around. Um, so I, I don't know how that would actually work, right? So the PPR generates 10,000 newtons of thrust at a specific impulse of 5,000 seconds. That means that the PPR-equipped spacecraft carrying four to six passengers could travel roughly a hundred thousand miles per hour. That's what they why said haven't we done that previously? I mean, it's just a matter of like advancements and technology. Yeah. 
So the spacecraft flying that fast would eventually have to slow down to reach its destination. How said the com the uh, company has accounted for additional energy and propellant. This would propellant. Uh, this would require to land on Mars. Um, let's see. You can pretty much achieve anything you want in the solar system once we get this technology running in 20 years. So much for us going there in two months. <laughs> yeah, so not just that, but they said 2030. You know that 2030 is only six years off, not, 30, right, not, not 20 years. Right, not 30 or 20, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's ambitious to get it going in six years. Good luck. Now, they said we that they're see. not going to do that. Yeah. It's going to be 20 years. All right, folks. Well, that's it for today's non sequitur news. I hope that you got a little bit out of this. So we're going to turn on our uh, our pea suits and pulsed plasma rockets and um, just blink. And we're back at the front page of Ohm Town. I want to thank you all for coming and hanging out, listening via the podcast or watching over on YouTube or here on Twitch as a VOD. Um, there's podcasts to download please like and review and go over to youtube and like there and and uh, follow us there and subscribe here on well you can't even subscribe i'm not a partner here on uh, twitch but uh, come and hang out that would be great we do the show every day typically at 8 p.m monday through friday and then we start at 5 p.m on saturday and sunday and do the shows take care kath Thanks for hanging out and chatting. Appreciate it. See you in a little bit. I am Merwat, and that is the Sentient AI. Thanks for joining us for Non-Sequitur News. Come back for our next episode. See you in a little bit. Oh, my pee-pee suit is leaking.